My name is Chris West, and welcome to this, the first in the series of videos on the Steinberg's Cubase program. This will introduce you to the program and the concept behind the sequencing package you're about to see. We'll be looking at a step-by-step -step guide through its functions, and also guide you through your very first session. Steinberg's philosophy is easy. It's one computer program on three different platforms, the Macintosh, the IBM PC compatible, and the Atari. There are four programs in the series, Cubase Lite, Cubase 2.5, Cubase Score, and Cubase Audio. Cubase Lite is an entry-level sequencer offering 16 tracks, editing, scoring, and printing. Cubase 2.5 version is the full program with the exception of printing and page layout, and of course, the audio facility. Cubase Score has all the functions of 2.5 with the ability to page layout, desktop publishing, and printing. Cubase Audio is at the top of the range. It has all the facilities of Score with the extra ability to record direct to disc analog sound. Other than the programs, there's a whole host of additional hardware for Steinberg programs. This is the MidEx Plus unit for the Atari ST. This will not only give you key expansion slots, four in this case, it also give you four more MIDI outs and also the ability to have timecode sync to tape. This is a card for the IBM PC compatibles. This gives you MIDI in and out. Okay, this is the SMP2 unit. This will give you professional synchronization for the Atari and the PC computer. Not only will it give you sync to tape facilities, but also mergeable inputs and assignable four different MIDI outs, giving you a maximum of 64 MIDI channels. For the Macintosh, we have two interfaces. This is the Mac MIDI 1. This will give you MIDI in and three MIDI outs, and also gives you the ability to connect your printer and bypass the MIDI function. This is the Mac MIDI 2 interface. This uh, offers SMPTE timecode, MIDI timecode, as well as MIDI in, two MIDI ins, and three MIDI outs or six MIDI outs, featuring 32 MIDI channels, as well as through buttons for your printer and your modem ports. One day computers fall into three main areas, a keyboard, a monitor screen, and the actual computer itself. Inside the computer is the working engine and we have memory in there called RAM memory, random access memory. This is an area where your program will reside and work and all data will be stored. This data is volatile. Should the computer lose its power, this will be lost. So for that reason, we have data storage. For example, a floppy disk or maybe an internal hard drive. Let's look at the three different platforms for Cubase. First of all, the Atari computer. This is the Atari 1040 ST, and it's mouse driven as you can see, and it has an internal memory of one megabyte, and this will run Cubase. Secondly, let's look at the IBM PC compatibles. You will need at least two megabytes of internal RAM and a hard disk drive to store your program on. Because Cubase works in a window environment, you will need to run MS-DOS 5 and Microsoft Windows version 3.1. And thirdly, the Apple Macintosh. You will need at least two megabytes of RAM to run Cubase. This computer is an IBM PC compatible, and it's a 386 processor. You will need at least a 386 or a 486 processor to run Cubase. The configuration of this computer is a four megabyte RAM and a 100 megabyte hard disk. 
Let's look at the way we install a disk protected Cubase program onto the hard drive. First thing we need to do is actually not talk to the internal C drive, we need to talk to the floppy disk drive. So I put the program in the computer and type in A colon and return key and this will prompt the disk drive to be looked at. That's the A floppy disk drive. The next thing we need to do is to actually address the directory. So if we type in dir and return, this will give us a list of the directory. Okay, we can see a choice of three programs, the Cubase, EXE, the install bat, and the readme first file. What we need to do is actually run the install bat. That's batch file. So by simply typing in install, space, the letter C, because this is the directory we want to actually put the program on, and a colon, and a backslash, and then we need to name a directory for this to be loaded into. We're going to call it Cubase. Now all we have to do is return file, and this will create a directory called Cubase on the hard drive. As you can see, the files have been created on the C hard drive inside the computer. We now have to enter Windows to complete the procedure. So we simply type in win, W-I-N, with a forward slash, and S for standard Windows procedure, standard mode. Return, Microsoft Windows version 3.1. The next job we need to do is to actually create a group window for Cubase. So this is easily done by under the option file menu we we'll click on there and the first item is new we want to click on that this brings up a, a special screen with two names in it program group and program item first of all we're going to use the program group to actually add our program into a window so by clicking on program group and OK in now we get a description title and we want of course to type in Cubase and then click OK again with the mouse. This has created a window called Cubase and inside this window we want to move the program and the MIDI setup. By simply going to File and New again we have the program item. Simply click on OK. We have a new window open. This time we'll go straight to Browse. What we're looking for is what's on our C drive. And under C, if we click there, we get a list of all the folders where uh, were automatically loaded into from the floppy disk. And under Cubase, we double click there and now if you look to the window to the left, we have two files in there. One is the program and the other one is the MIDI setup. By simply clicking on Cubase EXE and OK in, and we can OK again, we have created the icon in the window. Now for MIDI purposes, we need to do the same again for the MIDI setup. So new, program item, OK, and browse, look into C drive again, and under Cubase file, the MIDI setup. Click on that, and OK it. OK again. This has created the Cubase program and the setup. We have one last thing to do before we can actually launch the program, and that is define what kind of MIDI interface under the MIDI setup. So by, so by double clicking on the icon, brings up a directory of user interfaces and in this case we're actually looking for the MPU type interface so we'll highlight that and OK it, make it active and OK it and this will load that MIDI setup for your Cubase program and of course to simply launch the program we double click on Cubase. This is the procedure for loading Cubase for Windows onto your hard drive. Programs such as Cubase Score for the PC will be key protected and the disk install will be done through the normal Windows application. This is an Apple Macintosh computer. This is a 2CX. It has a 4 megabyte RAM and a 40 megabyte hard drive. Programs that run on the Macintosh fall into two categories. They're either disk protected, that means the protection is on the disk and it has to be installed onto your hard drive, or it's key protected as Atari programs are. Let's look at the two different ways that these are installed into your computer. First of all, the disk protected procedure. The Macintosh has an icon based system just like the Atari and if I double click on this icon here this is the hard disk drive. 
If you're not used to double clicking, keep trying, it has to be very fast. We've opened a window here, and inside this window we have a system folder. This is necessary for the Macintosh system to run. Our next stage is to open an empty folder within this window. And this is easily done by the following procedure. At the top of the screen you can see five titles and an Apple sign. Under these titles are what we call drop-down menus and simply by placing the mouse over and clicking with the mouse and holding down you have drop-down menus. Under one of these menus, under file, we have new folder. This is what we need to create a new folder with and by releasing the mouse we have a new folder icon with the words untitled folder. If you just type straight in now the word Cubase and click with the mouse, it has been retitled Cubase and that's the symbol for a folder. The next thing we need to do is to actually install the disk by putting the disk into the disk drive. We place the disk in the disk drive and immediately on the screen, the right hand side, you'll see an icon saying program disk. Here it is. And by double clicking, we are going to see what's inside that disk. And you can see a new window that is activated and it's symbolized by these lines at the top where this one isn't activated because it's white. And inside we have a readme first file, a Cubase program, and a teach text program. What we need to do to install this disk protect procedure is to double click on Cubase 2.5. The next screen you will see is the install screen. And this enables us to either install onto the hard disk, and there are two installs on this disk, or even launch the master. This means you will be working off the floppy disk. For the purpose of this video, we're going to install it on our hard disk. I double click on install. The next screen is asking me exactly where do I want to put this program and this is our empty file that we've actually renamed Cubase so I'm going to click on there, double click and install. The procedure now is the program is being installed into that empty folder. OK, as you can see, it said it's completed, and it can take up to about 20 seconds depending on the speed of your computer. Now I'm going to quit out of this program, the install program, and move the program disk away so you can see where we've copied it into. And simply by double clicking on this folder, I'll open up the folder called Cubase, and as you can see, the Cubase program is inside. Now, that's not the end of the uh, operation. We have to actually copy the other two disks that come with the pack into this folder as well. So what I will do is, first of all, close this window by clicking there. And I will remove the disk from the drive by simply clicking on with the mouse and dragging this icon down to the wastebasket at the bottom. Release the mouse and the computer disk will be ejected. The next thing we need to do is to place in the next disk, which is additional files one. If you place it into the computer, it will automatically come up on the right hand side. And we need to open this by double click again. And inside you can see several items. And if I click on the bottom, I can actually open the whole window. I need to take these three items and put them into this folder. Uh, there's two ways I can do this. I can simply hold down the shift button on the keyboard and click once on each or I can actually click away from the icon and hold down and drag the mouse across the three files or there is a third way which is Apple key on the computer and A select all we need when they're selected to literally click on them and drag them into the window space of Cubase and release. This will copy all these files into the Cubase folder. The next job we need to do is the additional files too. This is exactly the same procedure as one. The 
we close the additional files one window and once again take the disk away into the wastebasket and release. Replacing the disk with disk number two it will automatically come up on the desktop and once again we need to open that. And I move the window away so I can see where I'm moving this. Once again, either elastic band across the whole seven programs here and click and drag into the window space and release. As long as the arrow is within the window, all these programs will go into that space. Included on this disk are drum maps, MIDI manager pages, mixer maps, and the Fostex drivers. Once this has been copied in, we can actually run our program from this Cubase folder. So this completes the installing of a disk-protected Cubase program. Close your window, eject the disk, and put these disks away for safekeeping in case your disk drive gets damaged. One other point you can do here is actually clean up the look of this by going to one of the uh, one of the drop-down menus and looking for clean up window. Once I take the click off, you see it actually moves all the icons into a space. It makes it look tidy for when you open your program when you want to use it. Now let's look into how we install the key protected programs. You have to have the key inserted between the keyboard and the computer, or in the case of a PowerBook, in the ADB bus. Installing a key protected program is actually simpler. Uh, after you've installed the key between the keyboard and the computer, which is in the manual, you can have up to five keys in line. You simply put the program disk into the computer, Double click on the program and it will open the window. There is several items here. One of them is a README first file, which if you double click on that, will actually give you uh, a read through instructions how to do this procedure. But we'll go straight to the installer and simply double click on installer. This is an automatic installer which actually will prompt you to do the following disk changes. Once this is loaded, it will request if I need to install and it will tell me where it's going to be installed onto. So simply click on install and what's happening now is the program disk is being copied onto the hard disk of the computer. And as you can see it mentions the program disk here and the additional files one disk. There's a set of three disks in Cubase score program and this will take between 15 to 25 seconds depending on the computer configuration you have. Now it's requested me to take out the program disk and put the additional files one in. When it sees that disk it automatically loads the files it needs. Okay, it's requesting that I put the original program disk back in the drive. As you can see it's very simple and it tells you what has to do. Okay, it says that it's successful and now you have to restart your Apple Mac computer. Okay, the computer's booted up and I can open up the hard disk drive and see where it's installed my Cubase score program. It's created a folder automatically. Now, if you were clever, you'd have noticed I talked about two additional disks and only one was loaded in. So we have one other function to do, in to install the additional files too. By just simply putting the disk into the drive, it would automatically come up an icon over here saying additional files too. Double click on the icon, it will open a window. I move this window down. As you can see, there's a lot of additional mix and maps and other functions you may need. It's advisable to actually move these all into your Cubase score folder. And by the methods I said before, either by clicking individually and holding down the shift, or Apple key on the computer and the word letter A will select all. 
simply by clicking on any one of the files and dragging it you can go straight into the folder when it turns black and release these items will be copied inside that folder right close the window and once again drag the disk into the wastebasket. This doesn't erase the disk as you might think as an Atari would do. This actually is the procedure for ejecting disks on the Apple Macintosh. Okay, that completes the install of a key protected disk on the Apple Macintosh. This is the Atari 1040 ST and it has one megabyte internal RAM and no hard drive. We load the program via the floppy disk. When you buy your Cubase pack you have three disks, one program disk and two additional file disks, and the key protector dongle. This plugs into the side of the computer, and the disks plug into the disk drive, of course. Let's look at the procedure of actually loading the program on the Atari. Cubase programs run on computers that have an icon system. And this is the desktop of an Atari. What we can see here is the black pointer for the mouse, and icons such as this A floppy disk. I can easily click on this icon and it is selected by turning black. If I click away on the desktop, it clears. If I actually want to see what is in disk drive A, I can just double click on this icon. This has opened a window and shows me what is in floppy disk drive A. In this case, Cubase program disk. And as you can see, there's more icons here. This one here is a, called a folder. This one is a program type icon and this is a file type icon and you can easily just select any one of these by clicking once with the mouse. Now it's very simple to launch the program. What we have to do is double click on the program. If this is the first time you've seen the Cubase program screen, uh, you'll see a lot of data on there and it can look very confusing. So what I'd like to do for you is to strip back the program and build it up in elements. So we'll have a look at the screen as it boots from your master disk. So what we're left with after I've stripped away everything is the basic desktop. We're in the Cubase program now and I just want to talk about the titles at the top of the page here. These are called drop down menus and if I move over them you'll see a list of facilities drop down for us. Now don't worry about what these are at the moment, I just want to show you how they work. I'm just moving the mouse over this. If this was a Macintosh computer I'd have to actually hold the mouse and click a button down. Let's do the first thing. Let's show you the basic screen. This is the main screen and I've stripped it back to be very simple. Basically as you can see down the left hand side are the different tracks and I can actually go down the tracks one by one. And this side is the linear path we're going to record onto. I imagine this to be like a tape recorder with this position marker going across the tape and recording and leaving its data behind. This is now playing in real time. Now the numbers at the top represent bars. If it was a tape recorder of course we'd be talking in time scale and I can actually convert this line into a time scale by clicking here. Now what you can see is 0 and then 0 and 6 seconds, 0, 12 seconds, hours, minutes and seconds. And once again, this would run as a tape recorder would across the tape. I like to think of this line as the tape head laying the music down onto the tape. For an example of this, let me load a new file. Here we see the tracks laid out as they would be on the tape recorder. And when I run the, my would-be head across the tracks, you can see the data would be recorded on different tracks. If this was a tape recorder, you would expect to actually play the tape recorder and, of course, at some point, drop into record. As I stop the tape recorder, I would leave behind an area of track recorded. This is the concept I like to look at when sequencing. So I can actually run my tape recorder back and play. A 
Okay, this way I could choose another track and have a different sound. For example, this is track 9, it's selected, and I'm going to record in this way. So run the tape recorder back and play. I dropped into record. Stop again, and as you can see, this is the path the tape recorder is taking. Okay, if it was a tape recorder, of course, a group would be playing together and they would make their own time base. Because we're dealing with a computer and we have our bars and beats at the top, what we actually need is something to play against. We actually need a click, and we have that facility, of course. We have the metronome working with a high note at the beginning of the bar. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Now this gives me something to actually play against. So what I'd like to do is erase what we've done already and start again. I can easily do that in the computer by selecting this part that I've recorded and by using the delete key on the keyboard erase that. And I select this one by clicking on it with the left mouse and the delete key. At any one time if I make a mistake when I've erased something with the delete key I can actually use the undo key and restore that track. So delete and undo. Okay so now we have a metronome to work with next thing I like to do is actually give myself a start and end time. Uh, because we're based on bars and beats, I actually bring in a locator point. A tape recorder would have a locator point and we'd say we'd record from say 10 seconds. With a computer based system you can work with bars and beats. So simply by clicking with the left mouse button under the number I can bring in a locator. And this line down here represents the start of bar 5 and by using the right hand mouse button I can bring in another locator at bar 9 the right locator point. This will give me an automatic start and finish point. So select the track I want to work on and simply go into record. We have two bars counting As you can see, I've actually recorded a result. Let's play that back. Right, let's look at another track. We'll go back to our percussion track on track 9 and listen to another recording. play that back. I'm fairly happy with my result. There's just one problem. It's all out of time. Now the computer has the ability to actually put your performance into time. And uh, we won't go into the reasons why, but I'll just do it. I'm going to select both parts by holding down the shift key on the computer and clicking on both tracks. These are now both selected and simply by pressing Q on the computer it automatically has quantized my result. Let's have a listen to that. Okay, we can actually do this as we record it and uh, I'm going to try and record some drums now on track 10 and I'm going to use a function over to the top right hand side of the screen called automatic quantize. By clicking on to the letters AQ for automatic quantize and it going dark, it's now selected. What this will achieve for us is, as I record, it will actually put my performance into time. Let's record some drums. Okay, by the automatic quantize facility, this made me sound quite tight, and this is what we actually need. Now, so far, you've seen me magically drop in to record and stop and start. If it was a tape recorder, of course, we'd have a remote, and we have the same thing on the computer. We call it a transport bar. Under the menu, Windows, we have a title called Show Transport. Let's click on that. 
So you can see at the bottom of the screen we have the transport section and we're going to first of all look at this center part here. And as you can see we have a play icon and we have a stop icon and we have rewind and forward. And this last one is our record icon. So I can play our result here. At any moment, stop. So if I was going to record, select a track, in this case track 4, it's going to be some strings, and using the record button will give me two bars counting before I go into record. As you see, when it got to the right locator point, it automatically dropped out. The stop button has uh, two or three functions other than just stopping from playing. If I stop twice, it goes to the left locator point, and stop three times goes to the beginning of the whole track. To the left of the transport controls, we have the left locator position. Uh, we positioned it with the mouse at bar 5, and there's the number there, and the right locator at bar 9. These can be changed very easily by just clicking on the left and right mouse to go down and up. So to decrease left mouse to increase right mouse. These other numbers here, this is the bar number, this is the beat number, and in one bar we're looking at four beats to the bar. The next number will be bar six, beat one. And the last number is the quantize per beat, and with Cubase we can go up to 383 and then it goes back to zero. Moving to the other side of the transport bar, we have the song position marker. This is bar, beat, and quantize. And if I should play, you'll see it scroll around bar 2, bar 3. You should also notice below this we have the relative time position. As a tape recorder would have time location, we have the very similar thing in Cubase. Except this time it's called Simpty Time. Uh, this stands for the Society of Motion Pictures and Television Engineers Standard Code, and this is used in video making, TV, and also music production. Uh, it's, a, it's a normal clock, and if I go back to the beginning I can show you. This is one hour, this is one hour, one minute, this is one hour, one minute, and one second. And at the end we have the frames. In America we have 30 frames per second. In England we use the European Broadcast Union Standard, which is 25 frames. So just to prove the point, one minute less than one hour would be 59 minutes. One second less than one hour would be 59 minutes, 59 seconds. To write of these two we have the time signature, in this case we're talking 4-4, four, four, and uh, you'll hear the click at 4-4. Four, four. But this could easily be 6-8. Let's play that. There's six beats to the bar. If you're really adventurous, maybe seven, eight. And below that, we have the tempo. And I can play the track, and I can speed it up by clicking with the right mouse now. And with the left mouse, come back down again. This is beats per minute. And as you can see, we're on 120 beats per minute, and there's a three-digit display where you can get really fine tuning, down to a thousandth of a beat. A further right to the time signature are two boxes. This is I and this is O. And this stands for the MIDI data coming in and MIDI data going out. If I play a note on the keyboard, you can see the MIDI. And as I take the key off, MIDI data is sent for note off. To the right of that we have the click. No click, click is highlighted and thus activated. At the very bottom we have sync. This is used for synchronizing to tape. We're back to the full screen now. Uh, you will notice I've purposely left some details out on the transport bar. Uh, we're going to build it up as we actually need these facilities. So now we understand the system of locators, how we can actually change them, and if I change down here you'll see the left locator moving backwards across the screen and forward. So I can actually move this by numbers, say right up to bar 9, 
and if I move the right locator forward to say bar 13, I can actually record now in this new section. I've selected the first track and I'm going to record from bar 9 to 13. Let's put it into record and we'll get two bars counting. <laughs> automatically it's dropped out for me. Let's hear what we've done. Okay, let's scroll back again. Now the first section that we can play stop there. Obviously I just have the piano. Now I have the possibility of actually going to track 10 and recording my drums again in the same area between bars 9 and 13. Or I have the option to actually copy. Copying is done very simply in Cubase. If I click on this part that we've recorded, I can actually move it around the screen very easily. I could move it to that section, but then I wouldn't have it on this section. So what I actually need to do is copy. Copy on Cubase is done like this. You select the part, hold down the alternate key on the keyboard, and then click with the left mouse and drag away and position it where you want on bar 9. This has effectively copied all the data from there and added it to there. Let's hear our result. <laughs> Okay, now we're not limited in these locator points. I can record from the beginning of the song to the end of the song. And to give an example of that, I'm going to move the locator point back to bar 5 again and leave the right locator at 13. And actually record on track 2 now, where we have a bass sound. So this time I have a part that's from bar 5 to bar 13. And by clicking magically on 1 on the keyboard, I can actually relocate back to the left locator. Play. Already we built up three or four tracks. Okay, let's introduce one more factor now, and it's down the bottom left hand side, and it's called cycle. What cycle stands for is uh, the ability to cycle between these two locator points. This is a great effect when recording because you can keep the computer running. So let's go back to the main screen. So I'm going to move my left locator point by clicking with the left mouse button to 9. Now I'm going to build up some more tracks. I'm going to go to, say, track 3, where I've got a brassy sound. And this time when I'm in record, it would actually loop around this cycle. This means I can keep the computer in record and actually change tracks and build up a, a, a section very fast. Let's, let's do it. stopping, select another track.
can see, without coming out of record, we've just been in cycle mode and we've been recording round. Let's hear it from the very beginning. Move the position marker back and play. You can see how fast you can build up sections in this way. Moving right back to the far left of the main screen, I want you to notice what we call the activity bars. As it plays, the activity is represented in this graphic form. Another facility that's available to you is the split screen. As I move the mouse over this, you see a hand produced, and if I click on it, I can actually pull this back. This introduces a new column called M. This is our mute. We can actually click on here and mute these individual tracks. Let's show you what that sounds like. It's just the drums and some percussion. And bring the piano in. We have a solo button. When this is depressed, this solos the particular track that's highlighted. So for example, track 9 is soloed, or I can select track 10, which is the drums of course. Release solo. We have the facility to actually name these tracks. In place of track 1 to 10, I can actually say the, the instrument being played simply by double-clicking on the name. And we have a box. And with the back space, I can actually backspace the name out and input the name of what I want to say is on that track. And I'll do this one. This is our base. Double-click. I can use the Escape key to clear the whole area and just simply put in my name and I'll do one more down the bottom track 10 which is my drum track okay let's name the others now I've named all the parts it's very easy to see what sounds are where and uh, just to show you one other event by putting the left and right locator and I'm on the drum track this is highlighted this means it's going to go into record between the left and right locator you will see if I do some recording I'm going to do a counting This time, I have an intro. And you will see that automatically, this part has been named after the title of the track. So you won't have these track one, two, three, up to 10. You have the actual names of the parts. This helps when you're cutting and splicing. It's worth mentioning at this point, um, we still have the auto quantize on. And even if I played this out of time, the computer has put it in time for me. Let's move on to another area. This is going to be the toolbox. By clicking with the right mouse button, the toolbox will come up. So this is the toolbox, and by keeping the right mouse down, I can actually select any one of these tools. And we'll be showing you what the functions are of some of these tools. For example, if I release the mouse on the scissors icon, as you can see, the mouse becomes the scissors. OK, for this example, let's have a look at the magnifying glass and what that does for us. The magnifying glass can be used as what we call a scrub tool. This is wonderful tool. I can actually click on here with the left mouse and you can see the MIDI data recorded on this track. And if I move backwards and forwards, you actually hear the parts recorded in there. And on this one. And I'll move up to the top and show you the bass. This is very handy to see what's actually on a track. Strings and percussion. Let's go back to the toolbox now. Select with the right mouse and the toolbox comes up. 
Release again, I'm back to my pointer. Let's look at one of the other items here. This one here, this is the rubber eraser, and with this we can actually wipe tracks out. Let's wipe this one out. Simply by click, clicking on with the left mouse, that's disappeared. And if I want to undo that function with the keyboard, it will come back again. So let's wipe some of these tracks away. Let's look at another function on the toolbox, the pencil. Pencil is used on many screens, but in this screen we can use it for actually extending tracks. With a pencil I can actually extend any one of these parts, so just by clicking on the end of the part I can actually draw it and make it, for this example, a bar longer. Back to the toolbox with the right mouse and let me select the scissors. The scissors is literally for cutting parts up. In this case I can go to here and click and cut that into two sections. If I move back to the pointer under the toolbox, I can click and move that about anywhere on the track. I can erase it by pressing delete on the keyboard. Let's look at one more function on the toolbox and that's the mute function. Release the mouse and I have an X. If I play from the beginning I can show you how this mute function actually mutes different tracks. Let's play from the left locator. Okay, if I want to stop the bass, piano, percussion, drums out. The advantage of using this mute, of course, over the oval track mute is that you're just muting individual parts and unmuting. And this can be used for different arrangements, for making different verses and bringing in different instruments without actually erasing the data, because you may change your mind at some point and actually want to bring this back in again. Now let's look what's the next column behind the screen, so to speak. And if we pull this back and let go, we'll actually see channels. These stand for MIDI channels. These are our MIDI channels going from 1 to 10. Now, obviously, you're using a MIDI keyboard to record your data. I'd just like to say a few words about MIDI. Um, I've always had a, a vision of how MIDI works. If you're confused about MIDI, I liken it to TV channels. For example, um, in your TV, down the aerial comes all the channels available to you. But because you select BBC One or BBC Two or ITV, uh, you actually tune that television into receiving that channel only. A MIDI is very much like that. If you select a MIDI channel here, it will broadcast only on that channel, and the instrument, in this case a piano, will receive the data on the track and play back that part and ignore all the other MIDI channels. So to use this MIDI channel facility, it means that we're not limited how many tracks we can actually send to the same MIDI channel. For example, if I want to make another drum track, I simply double click in this area and automatically I get a track 11 and I can change this number from MIDI channel 11 to 10. Now both these, these two tracks are talking to the same MIDI device. In this case it's our drums. So I might like to rename that drums and in this case I have two tracks of drums. So I could maybe call it drums 2. The reason for this is I might want to record some cymbals or tom-toms along with the drums I've already recorded. Do remember that this virtual tracks down this way can go up to 64 tracks with Cubase. MIDI is a system that goes up to 16 different channels. And with the aid of some of the hardware devices we showed you at the beginning of the video, you can actually expand that, 32 MIDI channels or even 64 MIDI channels using the Steinberg's SMP2 module. So to follow on, I'm going to put uh, our drums back to MIDI channel 10 because that's the unit, that's the MIDI channel the unit is listening to to play my drums. And uh, for example, I can underline this by adding extra tracks. You add an extra track by double clicking in this area. And automatically you can see track 11, and if I double click, track 12 and maybe track 13. Now what I would like to do is add some more drums, some Tom Tom fills maybe, so I can rename this by the double click and escape method used before and put uh, drums 2 in there and rename this one
This one drums four. Now my problem is that uh, drums two, three and four are talking to different MIDI channels. I actually just want to talk to the device listening on MIDI channel 10. So simply with the left mouse click and take these numbers down. Or you can actually double click in that box and type in a number and return. So now I have three more tracks all talking to the same device. So let's highlight this one because this is the track I want to record on and do some more drums. going to record let's play back what I've done if you're not sure what you've done you can easily solo it using the solo button down the bottom here's my tom tom fill and play it back with all the drums in Okay, let's add one more part drums. This time I'm going to use another snare drum. Okay, let's play that back. With this method I can build up my drum tracks. If I was programming this on a session, I suppose I would dedicate one track to my bass drum, one track to my snare drum, one track to hi-hats, tom-toms, etc, etc. This way I can actually mute passages and bring them in as I choose throughout the song. Let's look at another function that's hidden underneath the hand. I'm going to draw it back and show you a column called Instrument. This is a device to actually tell you, we know we're talking about drums, but what instrument are we talking to? And by simply double-clicking on this line, I can actually give it an instrument. In this case, we're using NAC IS-1000. Now, as soon as I return this, not only will it tell me that the S-1000 is listening on MIDI channel 10, but it'll also add it to the other tracks. This tells me that all these other tracks, because they're broadcasting on MIDI channel 10, are going to the S-1000. Let's name up some of the other instruments. At the top of the screen we have the piano playing on a DX7. Now this time when I've returned, this is the only instrument broadcasting on MIDI channel 1, so this is the only instrument talking to the DX7. If I should change this channel to 1, you'll see DX7 come up. Okay, let's name some other instruments here. Channel 4, we have the Proteus Emu. This has an added function. If I select a new track, I can actually go to the instrument area and click on, and a menu will pop up with all my instruments I have available to me, and I can select one of these by releasing. This not only tells me what instrument I'm talking to, it would automatically set the MIDI channel to that device. Now we're going to look at uh, another facility hiding underneath the hand. Uh, believe me, this does stop somewhere, but for now, we'll just show you this next column. This is called Output. At the moment, we've been using the in and out of the Atari MIDI connection. But uh, we have other devices that we talked about at the beginning of the video, the MIDX Plus and the SMP device. If I click on this Output, I get a scroll of list of choices, and I can choose any one of the SMP outputs, and if you remember from the beginning, I, I said that any one of these outputs has 16 MIDI channels on it, thus you can get 64 MIDI channels at the same time. MIDX output, 1, 2, 3, and 4. Okay, I have one more column to show you, and it's the track define. These all defined to MIDI tracks because we're recording MIDI data, but we do have other devices under here. If I click on one of these tracks, I have MIDI track, a drum track, a group track, a tape track, that's for FOSTEX a synchronization and dropping in and out a record, and a mix track, which uses a device called MIDI Mixer inside. We won't go into these at the moment, but just to show you, they are there and selectable. For example, the percussion could be put to a drum track, transformed to drum parts, yes, and all the percussion we've recorded can be now edited in one of the edit screens that we'll be talking about in part two.
Now, the other advantage we have here is we can actually move these around. If I want to move this to any format that I like to work in. And uh, what we're looking to now is to get back to the original screen you saw at the beginning of the video. And you would find it would look something like this. Of course, you can close this down as far as you like to see more of the actual track working space. And whilst I'm talking about the actual working space of the track, let me just home in on two other areas we haven't talked about yet. And that's these scroll bars at the top and bottom and at the side here. Simply by clicking on the left mouse, I can actually scroll through the song, and you can actually see the scroll bar at the bottom moving along and the track slowly going out of picture. I can actually click on the scroll bar and move that, and it instantly will jump back to the beginning of the track. I have another function with the scroll bars. Using the right mouse this time, I can actually make the bars go closer together so I can actually see more of the song. Now, as you can see, we're going from bar 1 right up to bar 33 on our screen, and this will go right down to about, depending on what tempo you're talking about, but as you can see, 240 bars. I think that's enough for anybody. The other end of this scroll bar, if I click with the right mouse again, it will actually expand it. And you have the same facility with the up and down mouse. I can actually go, that's fully that way. And the same with this. I can actually squeeze all the tracks down. So if I had 64 tracks this way, I could actually squeeze them all down and expand them. I click on the arrow with the right mouse button. There we have it. Make it really big. This may be useful when you're using the toolbox and uh, you're actually using the scrubber device. Gives you a closer zoom in facility. So to get back to the screen you saw at the beginning when I loaded the program, we have one more thing to show you and it's called the inspector. So under this icon in the bottom left hand corner, I click with the left mouse and what we get a whole information pack on whatever we highlighted. So if it's uh, the drum track or the bass track or the piano track, you see the names changing in the boxes here. So let me click on this one. This is the melody track. This is information all about this track and it tells me the instrument, the output, the MIDI channel and loads of other functions. Let me just play the computer. Under program, I can actually change the sound. Or I can double click, actually type in a program volume. I can actually change the volume in real time. Or transpose. These are all real-time functions. And if I'm talking to a part, it will change, and the information will tell me this part is called the melody intro, and it's on the instrument, and I can change the actual transpose of this part rather than the whole track. OK, so whatever we select, a drum track, it will give me that information. This way, you can actually change from section to section and choose a new program or velocity or maybe a delay. It would even do minus delays for lazy drums or lazy sounds, string sounds. OK, let's go into part two now and actually start from this blank screen and do our first session together. So we're going to now do our first session and you can either work with me step by step or just watch the video and work on your computer later. This is the main screen as it loads from uh, stand in and it's called the default arrangement and it's up there and this can be changed and personalized to your own use but uh, let's for the purpose of this let's make sure it's going to react the way I want it to react my first job is to make sure that the metronome is going to give me my counting that I like to work with and by double clicking on click a central box will come up a thousand different users of Cubase will use in a thousand different ways. But I like to use with the MIDI click off because I have the metronome in the computer to guide me. I like to work with the pre-roll on as well. This will give me two bars running on the sequencer before it goes into record. Okay, now I'm happy with that. I can actually OK that. I also like to work with the inspector closed down. The main reason for this is I can look into that later. It gives me more space on the screen to see my song. 
I would like to work with my automatic quantize on and I like to work in punch mode. You have choice of three here, you have mix, punch and normal. I'll explain the difference. Mix will mix the data as it cycles round and punch will automatically go into record. So if I make a mistake at the end of the bar, next time round when I play it will automatically punch in. Or normal will record first time and then stop. So I've selected punch. Further to this I like to use the cycle mode to record and I also like to always start at bar 3. This is in case for some reason I need an intro uh, before the counting. The other factor I want to change is these tracks from 1 to 16 I want to actually put in the sounds that I'm going to deal with and the MIDI channels and its device outputs. Let's check how it comes with the boot up program. There's the instrument section which is blank because we haven't customized it yet and there's the output section which is talking to the Atari. Of course if you have one of the MIDI devices you can actually select them and that would be your output device. The first thing to do is actually name the tracks that you want to use and I'm going to start customizing it to what I want to see. And you can name these tracks in any order that you like. So I'm going to go straight to my default setup. So I've named the titles that I want to work with. And I have one other function to do because I'm going to work in cycle mode. I want to actually, rather than overdub, I want to replace. This uh, links up with the punch facility I've used up here. The idea is that uh, as it cycles round, if I make a mistake, I can actually just start playing at any one point and it will go into record. You'll find this a very fast way to work. So what do I need? Bar 3, left locator, to bar 5, and I'm going to select my hi-hat track because I want to do a counting. Let's do the first recording now. As you can hear, it's cycling round. And that's my counting. I'm happy with that, so I don't have to do anything else. Stop the computer. You can either stop the computer using there, or I'm using the space bar, or zero on the keyboard. Next thing I need to do is to build up a basic bass drum pattern. So I'm going to use the next four bars for this. So I'm going to move my right locator, right mouse, and my left locator, left mouse. And I'm on the kick track now. Let's just record this. We're going to now do our first session and you can either work with me step by step or just watch the video and work on your computer later. This is the main screen as it loads from uh, standing and it's called the default arrangement and it's up there. And this can be changed and personalized to your own use. But uh, let's, for the purpose of this, let's make sure it's going to react the way I want it to react. My first job is to make sure that the metronome is going to give me my counting that I like to work with. And by double clicking on click, a central box will come up. A thousand different users of Cubase will use in a thousand different ways. But I like to use with the MIDI click off because I have the metronome in the computer to guide me. I like to work with the pre-roll on as well. This will give me two bars running on the sequencer before it goes into record. Okay, now I'm happy with that. I can actually OK that. I also like to work with the inspector closed down. The main reason for this is I can look into that later. It gives me more space on the screen to see my song. I would like to work with my automatic quantize on. And I like to work in punch mode. You have choice of three here. You have mix, punch, and normal. I'll explain the difference. Mix will mix the data as it cycles round and punch will automatically go into record. So if I make a mistake at the end of the bar, next time round when I play, it will automatically punch in. Or normal will record first time and then stop. So I've selected punch. Further to this, I like to use the cycle mode to record. And I also like to always start at bar three. This is in case, for some reason, I need an intro uh, before the counting. The other factor I want to change is these tracks from 1 to 16, I want to actually put in the sounds that I'm going to deal with and the MIDI channels and its device outputs. Let's check 
how it comes with the boot up program. There's the instrument section which is blank because we haven't customized it yet and there's the output section which is talking to the Atari. Of course if you have one of the MIDI devices to actually select them and that would be your output device. The first thing to do is actually name the tracks that you want to use and I'm going to start customizing it to what I want to see. and you can name these tracks in any order that you like. So I'm going to go straight to my default setup. So I've named the titles that I want to work with and I have one other function to do because I'm going to work in cycle mode. I want to actually, rather than overdub, I want to replace. This uh, links up with the punch facility I've used up here. The idea is that uh, as it cycles round, if I make a mistake, I can actually just start playing at any one point and it will go into record. You'll find this a very fast way to work. So what do I need? Bar 3, left locator, to bar 5, and I'm going to select my hi-hat track because I want to do a counting. Let's do the first recording now. As you can hear, it's cycling round. And that's my counting. I'm happy with that, so I don't have to do anything else. Stop the computer. You can either stop the computer using there, or I'm using the space bar or zero on the keyboard. Next thing I need to do is to build up a basic bass drum pattern. So I'm going to use the next four bars for this. So I'm going to move my right locator, right mouse, and my left locator, left mouse. And I'm on the kick track now. Let's just record this. If I'm not happy, at any one point I can go into record, and I'll show you that when I do the bass. Now if I like, without stopping, I can actually move down to the next track. Either click with the mouse here, or I can use the up and down arrows to change from track to track. I moved on to the snare track, and I want to hear it, so I'll unmute it, and add the track. I'm happy with that. Let's move on to some hi-hats. Next track down. Now this time, I played the first half, but not the second half, so I'll drop in. If I press the space bar, I can stop and I can hear my result. Let's run right back. Uh, running backwards and forwards, of course, as we talked before, is left and right mouse. If you want a shortcut for that, you can actually do it with the open brackets and closed bracket signs, which are located above the 7 8 key on the Atari keyboard. The closed bracket will move forward and the, and the open bracket will move backwards. Also, I'm going to use, instead of play here, a shortcut on the on the keyboard which is enter next thing I'd like to build up is maybe a tom tom intro so I can move to the tom track and I want to do the bar just before it comes in so I'm gonna place my locator points over that section into record I'm going to go into record either using this key here or the star or asterisk at the top right of the number keyboard. Okay, I'm fairly happy with that. Next thing I want to do is hit a cymbal beat on the first beat of the bar. So I'm going to move down to my cymbal track and relocate my locators left and right there, because I want to actually come in here with the opening cymbal crash. Let's record that. Two bar count in again.
Okay, I have the basis of a drum pattern. I'm going to select the bass guitar track now and uh, show you how the punch facility works in cycle. Hit record. We have a two bar count in. I'm going to do my bass track. Now, at the end of the four bar pattern, I've made a mistake, and simply by playing the MIDI keyboard, it would automatically drop in the record. That's my mistake, and I'm hoping to repair it this time. So the mistake has been taken away and automatically dropped in. Okay, I'm quite happy with that, I'm going to keep that. If I'd have been using in cycle mode instead of replace overdub, it would have added the two performances together, but I wanted to do this automatic drop in facility, that's why we're using replace. So I'm happy with my four bar groove. Next thing I want to do is to move on to the next section up here. So what I want to do is not record this all again, I want to actually copy this. And as we talked about in the first part of the video, we simply select by clicking on with the left mouse. If I want to select other items, I hold the shift key on the keyboard and select away. These are all now selected and by holding the alternate key down, I can click on and drag to wherever I would like. Obviously that's in the wrong position, so I can simply drag it back. Now, I click away from those and they're deselected. What I want to do is actually, in the next four bars, add my piano. So I want to move my left and right locators over here. Remember, the right mouse for the right locator and the left mouse for the left locator. I'd like to win mention one other function here whilst we're talking about locators moving, and that's to the top right over here. This is the snap pop-up menu. Uh, currently it says bar and if I click on with the left mouse you see this pop-up menu to choose. I can actually take the snap off and if I move, click with the left mouse, I can actually move this and leave it anywhere in between. And if we take a look right down at the left locator, down the bottom, we will see these numbers automatically changing as I move the left locator backwards and forwards. And as you see, wherever I leave it, the quantized value 192144. Okay, if we go back to the snap box and see the other functions, in the pop-up menu we have the choice of snap to the bar, or snap to a half beat, quarter beat, eighth note, or sixteenth note. Normally this would be left on bar because that, that's a normal routine. Just to the right of this snap box is our mouse box, and at the moment it's blank. If I move the, the cursor into the window, you can see it actually changing on what bar that we're looking at and in conjunction with the snap box, if I set it to off, you will see the mouse actually give exactly where I'm pointing. This is helpful for picking tracks up and dropping them in and knowing exactly where you are. Further to the right, we have a quantize box. Inside the quantize box, we have the value 16. This is 16 notes, so the automatic quantize is slotting my mistakes into 16 notes exactly. I can click on the number and choose a different value, maybe eight notes or quarter notes, four beats to the bar. We also have the facility to actually switch it off completely and have a completely free form if you're going to play some complicated jazz chords and you want to get your whole performance, you don't want it quantized, then switch it off. Also we have triplet values here and also dotted note values this side. Right, I have my first four bars intro and I've copied across to the next four bars and I'd like to add my piano track. So I'm going to select the piano track there. I'm going to actually switch the quantize off for this just to show you how badly I can play the piano. Here we go, into record. <laughs> So if you're a piano player and you want to get the nuances of your style, then this is the way to work out of quantize. So I've recorded my piano, such as it is, and what I want to do is actually add a symbol here. I could, I could go there with the left and right locator and just record it, but I might as well copy this one here. So click on it, hold alternate down on the keyboard, and drag it into the position I want. Um, maybe my toms as well. Let's click on that, alternate down, copy it across. As you can see, you can build up your track really fast like this. 
Let's play that. Right, it's cycling around that part. If I don't want to cycle, I have to switch cycle off. Let's run back a little bit and play again. Right, this brings me on to one of the most important things about computer sequences. You need to save your result. If this computer for any reason should switch off, then you've lost your song. So let's go through the facility how you save and load your song. What we will need to do first of all is format a disk. I put a disk in the disk drive. This disk is already formatted, but if it wasn't, I can uh, easily format by going to one of these file menus and go down here and you'll see format disk. If I click on this, you'll get a box up. And simply choose which drive we're in. In this case, we're in drive A. And if it's single-sided or double-sided disk. This is already set on the outside of the disk if it's a single or double-sided disk. And simply click on here and you will format a new disk. This following procedure is how we save and load songs in and out of Cubase. In the file menu, once again, drop down menus give us several options. In this case, we want to save. Click on that with the left mouse, and you've got a selection file type box up. It's worth noting if this box says save or load, and many files have been lost in many sessions by not noticing you've actually said load instead of save. You have a choice of seven options here, and this can be from song file to arrangement file, or a single part, or a MIDI file. The last two are drum maps for the edit screens and your basic setup. This is how you would save if you've customized your own setup to disk. You can click on this and save your custom setup. In this case, we want to save a song, which can be up to 16 different arrangements. Click on one. Now the next box that comes up will depend on what computer system you're working on. This is the Atari's TOS system box. If it's Macintosh, then you, of course you will get the Macintosh set up. Now if you look, it looks a bit complicated, but it's basically saying in disk drive A, it's looking for a file extension called All, which is the file extension for song. So in this next line, the selection, I can actually name my song. And simply by either backspacing to take it all away, or escape key, I can type in a title. So in this case we'll call it Song 1. Imaginative, but there you go. And clicking on OK, this will save our song to our disk as a song file. When it's complete, the box will close and we'll be back to our main screen. Just to show you how we would load that again, go back up to the File menu, and this time choose Open and the selection file type box will come up again. This time you notice the word load. And we're going to choose one, which is our song. Click on there. And you will notice a prompt box has come up saying stop. It's a warning sign to say that if you try and load the song, you will erase the song already in situ in the computer. So we can either cancel or OK it. You will notice out of these two boxes that there's a thicker line around the OK box. This is indicated if you hit return or enter on the keyboard, it will select that one. So in this case, this case we're going to click on OK. Now this is the Atari box again, the TOS system. And you might be able to notice at the back the song that we're working on has been erased already, waiting for me to select a new song. I can sim simply click on the song one and OK it, or double click on the song. The disk icon comes up to show it's being loaded. If you should want to save it as an arrangement, you can do that as well under the file menu again, save. The select box will come up and this time we're going to choose number two, arrangement. Now all songs can have 16 arrangements. This is the way we can actually load many arrangements into the computer at the same time and save them later as a song, 16 different arrangements. So double click on arrangement. I'm going to save it as an arrangement this time. Let's call it song one. Click on OK. And you'll see the extension is ARR this time. The difference between the two functions is simply that if you save song, you save all the functions, all the setup functions, all the parameters that you preset if you load a, 
and save an arrangement, you're just loading the data and its tracks. When you load an arrangement in, you can actually choose between them very simply under the Windows menu at the top here. This ticked item here is the song that we have in situ in the computer. I can easily change to another arrangement by clicking on this one. This is DEF1, the one we did earlier. The whole screen has changed and as you can see it says DEF1 arrangement at the top. And let's just show you that I can actually play this and show you a different track. And simply switch back very quickly to the, the song that we currently were working on. So you can clearly hear the difference between these two arrangements. You can even paste between arrangements. I can select by the rubber band system and copy this. This is another function under edit this time. Copy and select another arrangement, the DEF1 arrangement. And find an area somewhere up here, put my left locator, and actually paste that in as you would do with a word processor. Let's paste that in under edit, paste function, click there and you can see that the other arrangement has been added to this arrangement. This is very versatile and very quick to use. In my experience of programming, I find that uh, once I've added another piece of music, maybe I've copied this, this whole, and I'll deselect some parts by holding shift down, I can copy this whole thing, move it forward. Once I've recorded a major part or made a major change, I like to save it again, so I've got all the versions. And a good idea is to, when you save this time, save, select arrangement, is to do one of two things. Either call it a different title, and you can do that by backspacing, and call it perhaps song two, version two, and save. Or you can keep the same title again, and when you go to, say, save, it will give, give you a prompt to ask you if you want to replace or back this up. If you replace, it would totally replace that file with this new one. If you back it up, it will not only write this new one, but it also make a backup of that arrangement, and it will be called ARB. It's always best to be safe when using sequences. Now, you might think we've saved this backup file, but where is it? Now, it's specially kept out of sight because you probably won't need it, but if you do need to find it, you must tell it what file extension to look for. And we can click on this directory line here, and there's the cursor, and actually backspace and change this to B. And if I click on this dotted area, we will read the backup file, and here it is. If I want to see everything that's on this disk, I can simply click on the directory line, backspace, and replace it with an asterisk like that. This time it will search for any file at all. Click there, and we see our original all that we saved, the backup file, and the new arrangement we saved. Remember, with sequences, to save as you go. It's very important. We're now going to talk about the edit windows in part three. This third section of the video, we're going to deal with the edit screens for Cubase in part three. This third section of the video, we're going to deal with the edit screens for Cubase. Uh, so far we've just recorded and uh, there's been loads of mistakes and I would like to edit these parts together. There's four main edit screens to deal with. And just to show you a brief overview, let's look at one of them. Let's uh, select a part and then in the menus we're going to pull down under edit one of these functions. We have a list, list edit screen, drum edit screen, a key and a score. Let's just look at the score one for now. And what you can see is one part, bar nine, it's the bass, it's in the bass clef, and if I play it, you can actually see the cursor line go over. And um, there's a whole lot of functions at the top here, and we're only going to deal with just a couple of them. Let's have a look at these two here. If I click on the info line, we'll see what happens. What we have now is an information line. This has loads of information that can tell us about the positions of these notes. Now, uh, we haven't got a note selected, so these are actually blank. If I should click on one of these notes, music, I know that uh, this note is a, a C on the bass clef, but what I don't know is how loud it is, how long it goes for, where it started. 
and that's the information we have here. We have the exact start time, which is here, bar nine, beat one, and it's actually the second beat of a of a eighth note. The length is is 125 position markers. The pitch is C2, and the velocity is 69. The note off velocity is naught, of course, because it's switched off. And lastly is the MIDI channel we're on. I can change any one of these functions by clicking and changing up and down. I can change the length. I can change the position where it comes in the bar. To the top right, we have a whole host of symbols here. And I'm just going to use one of these for this demonstration, and it's the ear. If I switch the ear on, I will actually hear these notes when I click on them. Or I could use the keyboard, the left and right arrows, to actually scroll through. And as I scroll through, you see the actual values change at the top here, different volumes. If I should want to change the volume, I can just go with the left mouse or right mouse will increase. If I want to change the pitch, this is the score edit page. And I'll show you one other function on this page, and it's the symbols button. And you can see a host of symbols that we can use to add to our score. I'm not going to get into the depths of scoring within this video, but just to simply show you an example. Lyrics is highlighted. I can just grab that and put it to underneath. And if I let go of the left mouse button, I get a special text input coming up. And I can just type my lyrics in here and uh, tab across to do the next one. And you will see when I return, we have our lyrics already set up underneath our notes. Let's exit this screen now. We have two ways to do that. We can either keep what we've uh, achieved or cancel. If we cancel, it will go back to before, uh, before we went into the edit screen. The shortcuts on the um, keyboard is return or escape. Escape would keep it the way it was. Return will keep it. If scoring isn't your tipple, well, maybe the key edit page is. So let's go to the key edit page. What we do is select the part we want to choose and go up to edit and select key edit. This time you can see on the left hand side a piano keyboard. And just as it does in the track, this is our time base. Let's play from bar five. Once again, you can see the cursor bar moving across the screen. And as it goes across the note, it plays it. Once again, we have an info line. If I click on info, once again, we have this line across the top for the exact data of each note we're talking about. So if I click on one of these notes, you can see it tells me what bar and how long it is. And I can step through once again using the left and right arrows. This is very handy for changing pitch or the length or the velocity of any note. Now we talked about the toolbox on the main screen. We have a different toolbox in the edit screens. Let's have a look at the toolbox. Once again we have tools available to us. These are slightly different to the toolbox on the main screen. We still have the eraser and the pencil, but we have this compass and we have this boot forward and boot back icons and a brush. Okay, the, um, the magnifying glass is, once again, anything we click on will play. It's very handy to know, to actually find out what note that is. Let's have a look at another function in the toolbox. Right mouse brings up the toolbox. This is the pencil. This pencil can be used to extend in notes. I can make that note a lot longer, and you can hear the difference. Or I can simply make it shorter by just clicking the left mouse. Other functions in the toolbox. Well, we have erase. If I have some data that I don't want to do, I can just simply just erase it like that. Remember, you always have the undo function on the keyboard. Now, the next function I'm going to show you is quite wild. It's the brush. If I want to scatter a lot of notes somewhere, this is useful for sound effects. It literally will just airbrush notes. And of course, I can erase it 
with the eraser as you would do with a pencil. Okay, we're going to leave the other functions in the toolbox. Okay, I want to show you one more function uh, on this screen, which is very useful indeed, and it's up here, it's the controllers. I click on it, and you'll see at the bottom of the screen, a new screen is opened up. For this purpose, we'll just put our hand on it and lift it up to see more data in here. Now, the idea of this is a real-time letting you know what the controllers, the controllers come with every keyboard. Normally, with a standard keyboard, you get a modulator wheel and a pitch bend wheel. It's set here to pitch bend, and at the moment, there's no pitch bend to be seen on this part. But if I click with the left mouse, it brings up a whole pop-up menu of functions I can look at. And in this case, we want to look at perhaps the velocity. And what you can see is loads of small lines showing the velocity of these notes here. And as I click on one, you can see that it actually goes black. And as I walk through with the left and right, and using the pencil in the toolbox once again with the right hand mouse, I can actually alter these volumes. So that's very loud. And if I play, you'll see the result of that. So these are very loud. Another function in the toolbox is the compass. This is used for maybe fading in or fading out drum rolls. We'll use it, we'll just show you what it does to the bass. It actually selects all the volumes. And uh, if I use the rubber band technique to select these in dark, you actually see the volumes clearer. And if I play what's going on, you'll hear the volume slowly fade away. Okay, one other function I want to show you down here is on another part. So we're re we return to the main screen. Now I'd like to show you editing on the second bass part and I can go straight to my editor this time just by simply double clicking in the part I want to edit. And here's our edit screen. Uh, here are our notes and here are the velocities. Now on this part I played a pitch bend so I'll click on here and I'll select my pitch bend. And as you can see right at the far right hand corner, I'll just scroll through a bit, a little dip of a pitch bend Let's see if we can actually hear it. OK, a little subtle, I think. So let's um, use one of the toolboxes to change it. So with the right mouse, the toolbox pops up, select the pencil. And by simply making sure that your snap is off and your quantize is off and holding down the alternate key, you can actually draw a pitch bend that you want. A little bit lower, a little bit higher. Let's hear what that does for us. <laughs> okay, the bass notes are very short. Let's uh, simply extend this bass note so you can hear what's going on. Here we go again. So you can hear it bend down and pull up again. Underneath our edit menu, we're going to look for list. OK, this is a list of events that are going on, and it, it shows you every item of that pitch bend that I've drawn in. Let's go back to the beginning of the bass part so you can just see some of the notes. OK, a lot of data here for you to see on this side. Here we have the actual position in bar and beat and quantize, and the length of the note, the value of the note, the volume of the note, and some other status information it says that this is a note and it's on MIDI channel 1. Later on we can see as we scroll through, by scrolling through I can actually look at the data in a different way. I can select a part and I can actually with the up and down keys this time go through one by one. You can see on the left hand side that this is a pitch bend information. It gives me my values and this is a note information. And the idea of this is a full listing of all MIDI events recorded. This is very handy if you should be recording things you didn't want to record, like Aftertouch. It will show up in this page here. You notice I've resized the screen now that this little arrow, and if I play it from the top, you'll see it actually change as the events go through. Okay, let's move to the right hand side now. This side we can see the actual event blocks lengths in time. This is the cursor bar, and if I run it backwards and forwards, you can see it playing. 
And further right, we have the velocity. And as soon as I move into that, you see the pencil, and I can actually change the velocity up and down of that one note. OK, let's go on to the last edit screen in Cubase. To show the drum edit page, we would have to change this percussion track into a, a drum track. Simply click on the little note which indicates a MIDI track, and the pop-up menu gives us the choice to go to drum track. And a little drum icon, a little drum track icon has come up there. OK, next thing we have to do is create, between left and right locators, a part. To create a blank part, you simply click on the track you're dealing with between the left and right locators. Double click. We have an empty part. There's nothing in there, and I'll play it to prove it. It's empty. What we do now is double click on this part, and it goes straight to the drum editor page. So we have a list down the left of the instruments, and you can load different maps for different drum machines. This is the default pattern for an MT32 setup. And it tells me the quantize of that note, and it also tells me what note numbers on the keyboard that is. So for example, uh, here's our high bass drum, and our snare, and our second snare, and hi-hat. Now, using the toolbox in this edit screen, right mouse, a different one again. This one has a drumstick in it. I select the drumstick, let go. And there's my drumstick. I, I can actually put the values in here without even playing it from the keyboard. So with the drumsticks, simply click on the first beat of the bar. And let's click on the third beat, and maybe one there, four and a half beat. This is the same. The song cursor will play through. Let's play that. And I can leave it running and add other things. Let's add a snare drum. Let's add this one. Now the reason it's playing twice is because I have the ear mode on and it will play as I go. Let's stop it. Right, hi-hats on this line. Closed hi-hat, half open hi-hat and open. Let's just add some in now. Quite simple. That's on, on the beat and the half open on the half beat and then an open at the end. Let's hear this. You notice down the bottom that we have the velocities. Now we're going to select the hi-hats. And there they are, I can make them quiet or loud. Let's run it in here, loud hi-hats. Or very quiet. Remembering that this is just the closed hi-hat, I select the half open eye out and take them down. The only loud part is the actual open hi hat. And once again, you have the choice of choosing any of the controllers with this pop up menu. Okay, in the toolbox, there's a function these kick forward and kick back. Let's have a go at that and see what happens. If I click on one of the items, it actually moves it forward or with the other back. This is handy if you've programmed a lot of hi-hats and actually in the wrong way you can quickly go over and move them like that. The different colors represent the different volumes. Uh, when I mean colors I mean grayscale of darkness. I'll just show you a couple of other small items in this edit screen. Obviously there's an awful lot to choose. There's, this side is muting different tracks and maybe if I want to copy these tracks I can once again use the rubber band technique, go over all the tracks hold alternate down and move it to its new position. These edit screens have multiple functions and uh, we just want to just give you a basic overview of what they can do for you. Let's return to the main screen. Another useful function that I use all the time is to copy this part. Other than just dragging, there is a facility to actually copy and it's under structure. It's called repeat. If I click on that, what we see here is the number of counts needed. In this case, let's do two more counts. And it gives you the option to make a ghost part or a real part. The difference between ghost and real is very simple. If I click that there, it makes a ghost copy of the original. This means that if I OK it, here's our new parts. And these are ghost parts. A ghost part means it's an exact copy of its original. And should you go into this original with the edit screen and change any part of it, these ghost parts will change as well. 
If this wasn't a ghost part, these would be individual parts on their own, and if any part was actually edited, it would stay independent. To finish off this first session on Cubase, I just want to show you one item under the options menu, and it's the MIDI filter. Let's click on it. This has been the stumbling block of many sessions. As it comes default, you can see that we have two boxes here. One is the through filter and one is the record filter. This means anything played on your keyboard will be sent through to the device listening to it. And the only thing filtered out is system exclusive. My suggestion would be that we filter out other things like aftertouch and maybe program change on both. The reason for this is when you play the keyboard, the aftertouch, there's a lot of data that goes inside your computer and if you're using an Atari 1040 with one megabyte of memory, you can soon fill up your song with data that you don't even need. This brings us to the end of our first session. And I'd like to say one thing to finish with. File compatibility. The song recorded inside an Atari can be played back inside a Macintosh or an IBM PC. Full file compatibility between platforms is a very powerful feature of Cubase. But there you have it. This concludes the first video in the series on Cubase and I hope it's unraveled some of its mysteries and seen you through your first session. Cubase is a very powerful program and has many sides to it. Further videos will look into the other features available to you. Thanks for watching. If you require further help, there is a Steinberg helpline available 2 to 5 on weekdays. Also, you can contact Club Cubase on 081 368 2245. That's 081 368 2245. Please be aware of grey imported software. Every piece of software sold through Harman Audio is supported by the official UK software Goldsill badge. <laughs>